Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back after the tea break. So the session that we have now is Sleepless in CIO Land, where I'm joined by three senior investors who are going to share their thoughts on what keeps them awake at night, at least from an investment perspective. Now, of course, we know there's a lot to choose from. So just from the session we heard earlier from Paul Johnson, so there's Brexit. We've also got climate change, potential for recession, aging populations, rise of robotics, to name but a few. So we didn't call this conference investing on the brink for nothing. So it really is a very good panel that I've got here with me this afternoon. So I'd like to introduce them. So start off with Joe Holden. So Joe is UK CIO from Mercer. So Joe moved into the CIO role last year and is a recognized leader in public sector consulting with extensive knowledge of the investment consulting world. So next up, I've got Rulof Salomons. So he's chief strategist at Kemp and Capital and a professor of investment theory and asset management at the University of Groningen. And he's also a regular market commentator in the media. And next to me is Daniel Booth, and he's the CIO of the 46 billion Border to Coast Pensions Partnership. And Daniel took up the role last year, joining Border to Coast from Saudi Aramco, where he was head of portfolio management based in Saudi Arabia. And during his eight-year spell in that role, he built up the oil company's investment program, which included corporate pension, endowment, and insurance portfolios. So the plan for the session today is for each of the panelists to take us through their initial thoughts, and we've got some PowerPoint presentations for that. And then we're going to move into a Q&A session. So please do send me through your questions on the iPad as we're going through the sessions. And we will also have some questions from the floor as well. So just to kick the session off, I'd like to hand over to Jo now to make her opening comments. OK, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Emma, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about three things um, this afternoon, um, something short term, something more medium term, and then I'm just going to talk about a bit of a bugbear, um, which actually opens up into something a bit longer term. But to be fair, all three things are probably linked to a degree. So in terms of the short term, now, off the back of the correction that we had in Q4 um, last year, the question we were asking um, back at Mercer was whether or not this represented a release, some, you know, a frothy market just letting off a little bit of steam, whether it was the start of a bear market, um, or whether it was actually a signal that there was something quite nasty on the, on the horizon. Now, you'll all be aware that sort of since the end of Q4, we've had something of a recovery. Um, markets are up sort of, well, equity markets are up something like 7% year to date. But, you know, we've not quite fully recovered all the losses that we saw in Q4. So maybe it was, top left, just a bit of a release that we saw um, in Q4. Now, if it was, I think we're very much the view that that doesn't mean to say that we're not still late cycle. Um, and if that is the case, you know, we'd be expecting modestly positive returns, um, all else being equal. Moving across to the middle, if it was um, sort of the start of a, a bear market, then yeah, modest negative returns for a, for a period of time. Or, and this is probably the bit that's keeping me and colleagues awake, is whether or not it is the start of something a bit more sinister. You know, sort of slightly emotive language, but maybe some sort of Armageddon that might be driven by debt saturation. Um, and that would give us negative returns for a persistent period to come. And I guess sort of the point there is that it would be something very, very different to the environment that investors have, have faced over the last sort of, well, 10 years or so. So moving on to the medium term, this was one of um, Mercer's themes. Um, and those of you that are familiar with Mercer would know that sort of every year we publish our, our themes and opportunities for the year ahead. Um, and in terms of 2019, one of the real concerns that we've got are just around changes in the global and political landscape. Um, and of course, those two things are, are absolutely interlinked. So if we look at globalization, I think we sort of take the view that there's a real credible possibility that the pace of globalization slows. 
Um, and you just have to look at things like sort of US Chinese relations um, to sort of give examples of that. But I think the thing that's kind of really vexing us is political risk. Now, one of my teams, some of you might know him, Alex Goddard, um, based in our working office, sort of one of our rising stars, wrote an excellent paper on this for us last year. And he was sort of arguing that, you know, the media, I guess, in particular, if you sort of focus too much on Brexit and Trump um, and, you know, sort of covering every sort of twist and turn through tweets, that there's actually just a bit of a risk that you're missing something quite, quite big. Um, and he argued that the thing that we might be missing is sort of the unwinding of decades of sort of internationalism, deregulation, trade liberalisation. And, and, you know, he sort of said those things, you know, particularly in terms of the wealth generating and also, you know, peace promoting benefits of neoliberalism neoliberal, even um, are there for us all to see. But actually, if you look at sort of the general population, there's a real feeling that a lot of people feel as though they've been left behind and aren't seeing the benefits of, of, of globalization um, and liberalism. So we sort of just have a little bit of a niggle that until those feelings, which are starting to swell, um, I think in some regions are actually kind of addressed, that political risks sort of will remain quite high um, on the agenda. And that's sort of particularly just because of sort of the uncertainty that populist policies to a large extent can, can create. So moving on to the um, bugbear. Um, so what we're showing on this chart here, um, and it actually makes me feel really old because it starts in 2005 when I remember writing papers as an analyst at Mercer where we were saying that yields were really low at 4.5%. Um, but essentially what this chart's doing, if you just sort of follow it, is essentially saying like the grey line is what actually happened. So it's just one year, one year short-term yields. That you can see that the grey line plots over time actually where yields have gone. What the dotted lines at different sort of time horizons are showing were kind of the predictions as to where interest rates were going to go at each of those time points. So we thought they were going to go up in blue in January 2010, sort of didn't. Then we thought they'd go up in 2011, they didn't. 2012 and all the way through. Now, okay, so expectations are coming down slightly, but there's still sort of a view that, that yields are going to rise. Now, I have absolutely no idea whether yields are going to rise or not. I probably express an opinion based on, you know, nothing cleverer than supply and demand and also sort of, you know, increasing bodies of evidence about sort of aging demographics, keeping yields um, low. So, but I don't stay away worrying about whether or not yields are going to go up or down. What I stay away worrying about is the fact that lots of investors, I think, I see, don't, aren't taking action, particularly on risk management, because they think that yields will rise at a certain point in time. Now, that's fine, having a plan to take action if yields rise. But what we're still seeing in some circumstances is that, that whole conversation around risk management is cut off because it's all right, yields will normalise at some particular point in time. And I think sort of more worryingly, we see that yield reversion and indeed more than sort of the market's expecting are built into models that people are still using to make um, pretty long-term decisions. Um, and that really does keep me awake at night. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, Joe. I've, my first slide is also one on interest rates, so I'll keep it brief on that one. This also keeps me awake at night and keeps clients awake at night. I, st I used to work at an insurance company in 2000, and from basically from 1999 till 2008, and I still have, an, I still have a guaranteed insurance which pays me 4%, um, which is fine for me, but not for the particular insurance company which won't be named here. Um, they're not far from here, though. Um, <laughs> three other... Um, if we think about things that keep me awake at night, I've made it easy for you. I have three pictures for you. Um, I'll be showing you a roller coaster uh, that keeps me awake at night. I'll show you some zombies. 
And the first one is the zombies. The second one, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. On, on the zombies, um, my wife studied physics and you saw the previous chart, rates at zero. And, and she told me, well, with, when the zero degrees, electrons start to do, start to act funny. And I said, well, that's fine. I'm an economist. And at zero percent, investors start to do funny things. And what we're seeing is, uh, and I, th I think Joe already hinted to that, is a lot of buildup of debt. And it continues. We've got more debt to GDP now in the world than we had in 2008. And that's fine. <laughs> Unless either growth slows down or interest rates go up. What is shown here is um, a chart taken from a guy from, from ASR, Absolute Strategy. And what they've done is look at the broad spectrum of, of US companies. This is US companies, but the same applies for European companies and surely does for Japanese companies, which was my first job running Japanese equities. I'm not afraid of, I've, I've used to <laughs> manage money in lower rate environments. And what you see here is the percentage of companies at a given point in time, which have a interest cover below one. So i.e. balance sheets, which are very stressed. Cash flows just enough to to, to pay interest rates or to pay the, the interest payments. Split in two parts. For the largest companies, which is the bottom line, and a percentage of those companies, of the big, really big mega cap companies, which have a very levered balance sheet, and the percentage is not that high. But for the remainder of the market, so the remainder of all companies out there, we are already at levels uh, which we've seen in 2000, 2008. And mind you, that margins are much higher now and interest rates are much lower than we were at that point in time. So there are zombies, um, zombie companies uh, out there. 15% of the Barclays Global Egg Investment Grade Index has an interest rate cover below one. 30% of the Barclays High Yield Index globally has an interest cover below one. So this is something that keeps me awake at night. Uh, luckily, zombies don't die, so you'll get your coupon. Um, but it's not good for the economy as a whole because the markets and economies don't really function the way they should be functioning. So the zombies. The second one is a crocodile. Um, and I blurred the crocodile a bit for you to be able to sleep at night. Um, and for me, economies are basically pretty simple. Um, they, a cycle doesn't die of old age. Uh, it basically a cycle that either dies because one rates of return on capital all of a sudden slow, or the cost of capital rises. And on the left-hand side, you see the leading indicators. So rates of return on capital, that was slowing, and it was slowing pretty fast in November and December. On the right-hand side, you see financial conditions as a proxy for the cost of capital. That was also rising pretty fast. So if I would be, I was having sleepless nights in December. <laughs> Because at that point in December, November, December, you saw that rates on capital were falling, growth was slowing, and at the same time, financial conditions were getting tighter, tighter, and tighter. Um, but luckily, markets gave a clear message, and Fed and all the central banks listened. So now we only have to worry about the left-hand side, growth flowing. So zombies, crocodile, and the roller coaster. Um, this economic cycle is, by the middle of this year, the longest in history. Uh, just to remind you, uh, this, we're now in June, we've probably surpassed the one which was the 1990s one. That's still the longest one out there. Um, but if we look at the economy and if we look at, at markets as a whole, I have trouble finding the real excesses which would normally lead to an end of see a real end of cycle. I don't see much of inflation. Um, I do see some inflation in financial assets. I do see some excesses of, of, of credit, but not really to that extreme that it would tilt things over. I do see the zombies, I do see the crocodile, but not really that it's gonna be a problem this year. If I would have, said, would have been here in December, I would have said, well, this probably something going wrong this year, but by now the Fed has stopped. Uh, the ECB is looking at to do some, some extension of, of credit. So we're probably passing on kicking the can down the road for probably another year. 
The problem is um, you don't see the excesses, but you don't really see the expected returns either, which is a pretty dilemma for, for us and for the advice we give to, give to investors. Because zero percent interest rates has pushed up a lot of valuation, so I can't really find a lot of things that I would tell clients on either a short-term horizon or a long-term horizon that's really cheap. That is something you should buy. Of course, there are pockets, um, and I think within Within equity markets, we see that value has been underperforming for a long time, which for me as a value investor gets me, gets me uh, enthused. And within credits, well, December and January was a great time to be buying public credit. Probably now you want to wait a bit longer, pick, the, pick up the carry, that's fine, but there's probably not a, a default cycle coming. Um, and maybe you find something in the, in the private market space where, especially in, in Europe, you could argue that a lot of the smaller segments of the markets uh, do look interesting because they don't get the credit, they don't get the equity, they don't get the money which they need, and private equity could step in to fill that role. So that's where we're seeing the opportunities. Um, Recently, Puff finished a paper uh, called What If Things Go Wrong? Some of the answers are, are in there and uh, happy to talk about that uh, more. Thank you very much, Rudolf. And Daniel, do you want to make your comments now? Thank you. So, welcome and thanks for inviting me today. Uh, so, just very quick background. So, Border to Coast. Uh, as Emma mentioned, is one of the eight pools set up in the UK to pool local government pension assets. Um, we are the largest of the eight, um, and we have a good mix of both private sector hires as well as government uh, employees from the local councils. So my objective is to build a world-class asset management organisation to compete with the Canadian pensions and the, the Scandinavian funds and so forth. So today I'm going to talk to you about what keeps me awake at night, which is probably not a, a good session for me because I'm known for being able to sleep on an aeroplane on the runway before it's even taken off. Um, but I'll try and give you some thoughts about things that worry me, but also more importantly, things that excite me about the future. So both sides. Um, on the worrying side, I think short-term liquidity. So apologies if you saw this slide at our conference uh, last year. So what we've got is we've got a lot of liquidity coming out of the system, uh, the Fed rolling off the balance sheet about half a trillion a year, the increased issuance by the US Treasury about half a billion a year, the roll down of the US fiscal stimulus, which has already peaked, and the repatriation of US dollar assets back to, back to the US. So these are all stimuluses that passed or are fading. We've also got the delayed impact of monetary tightening, which tends to take 12 to 18 months to work through to the economic cycle. And we've got the ECB rolling down their program at year end. So all these things together was basically why the markets reassessed in the fourth quarter, the forward looking earnings uh, projections and why earnings, uh, future earnings came down substantially. So what's happened in the first quarter 19 to counter that? We've had a very dovish turn from the Fed. So they were quite hawkish at the end of 18, talking about raising rates. Uh, as they saw some of, the, some of the data, they've turned to implying that the cycle is at uh, or near an end in the interest rate hiking cycle, and potentially some of the Fed roll down may, uh, may reverse as well later this year. We've also had a lot of stimulation from the Chinese. Um, so you've had the two biggest economies basically uh, stimulating the markets, and even the ECB talking about bringing back an LTRO program. So I think the backdrop is still, there's a lot of liquidity coming out of the market, um, but some of the near-term perceptions of that are slightly less because of some of the, the, the policy changes by, by some of the central players. Still, I think it is gonna be a, a challenging environment from 19 onwards. So that's short term, that's liquidity, and that's really what impacts markets, and that's why we're seeing the big gyrations in the fourth quarter and first quarter. Uh, longer term, uh, demographics. So if you think about it, there's two really big forces playing out in developed markets, debt and demographics. I don't have the debt slide up here now, but if you put government debt with private sector debt and entitlement programs, you'll see every developed country has about 10 times debt to GDP ratio. 
So those future uh, promises to pay, questionable whether or not they're, they're sustainable in the longer term. In here, we're showing the support ratio in, in black, which is the number of, workers per, number of workers to a retiree. And you can see that this is declining as the economy ages. And what we've got on the, uh, we've got a support ratio of four. So that's the level that we were in 2010. So for the UK to sustain a support ratio at 2010 levels, these are basically the retirement ages that we need in the UK. So you can see it's up to 70 by 20, 2030. So these longer term demographics are going to be a big challenge for us. Um, as mentioned, Japan has had similar challenges for a much longer period and they've had good productivity growth uh, in counter to the UK, which has had poor product productivity growth, as we heard earlier on for the last 10 years. So there are ways that you can address the situation, but debt and demographics are big features that will play for a long time going forward. So highly indebted societies with aging workforces. Um, this is a, a slide on, a, this is a real hotel, so a Japanese hotel, um, talking about some of the technological changes that are happening at, at the minute and some of the opportunities and some of the excitement around those. Um, so I was with a partner in my old firm. Uh, we built a, a chain of hotels in Japan that did very well because of the increased Chinese tourism. And one of the things that we did with, that we thought was quite innovative was replace the, but, the, the bellboys with robots. So you could talk to the robot and you'd save the staffing cost. This is a different hotel in Japan, uh, the source is on the bottom there, where the whole hotel was run by robots. So this is your check-in desk and you've got three different types of robots. This really does exist in <laughs> Japan. Um, it probably says something about your personality, who you choose to check in with. Um, but it's... It does exist. Um, so employment. So employment going forward is going to be a little bit different. So when we're thinking about this, we're still teaching our children um, education for the industrial age. We really need to switch and teach people for the digital age. Really, there's a lot of changes going on, and we need people to have the skills to adapt to those new challenges and to thrive. So for your kids, for your employees, uh, for your communities, uh, the, this is a big trend going forward, and this, if you're on the wrong side of it, um, can be very painful, but if you're on the right side of it, it can be a huge area of future growth. So, I, I would say, I don't think technology is, is necessarily a bad thing, but just it has to, be, has to be equal. So we've had a lot of income inequality growth over the last decade or so forth, um, so we need to make sure that it's properly supervised and regulated and the cost savings from technology are spread broadly across society. Uh, electric vehicles. So interesting one, Easter Day Parade in, in 1900 and 1913. On the left, spot the car. On the right, spot the horse. So how quickly can things change? So probably if I come back here in a year's time, I would imagine the changes will not be huge, but if I come back in 10 years' time, I think the changes will be, will be massive. Uh, in New York at the turn of the century, uh, shoveling horse manure was a, was a big employer. Um, so obviously that went away with the horses and people became pet, petrol pump attendants. So just adapting to the new realities is, uh, is an important, uh, important thing and to be aware of the changes that are ongoing. So what I would say is that I wouldn't buy a high-valued petrol car at the minute because I think in five years' time there'll be no resale value on those, those, those vehicles. So a practical point for you may be to, to help. So Google in California at the minute is, is transporting its workforce in two-seater pods, autonomous, autonomously driven electric vehicles, and that's probably what the future of cities will look like. Uh, energy renewables here. Uh, this is in Dubai, so the Middle East, uh, close to where I used to work. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the chart at the bottom left, you'll see the cost for a gas-fired power plant, and then you'll see the cost of solar energy at different points in time in, in Dubai. So you can see the fight, phase one, which is the one on the far left. Uh, they did that when it was generally uneconomical, so it was, it was more expensive than gas-fired power plants. Phase two that you see here, now it's starting to get cheaper, so we build a much bigger plant, 
and then it gets substantially cheaper, so what do we do? We'll build an even much bigger plant than that. So you can see this from space nowadays, so the Great Wall of Solar in the, in the desert in Dubai, Abu Dhabi is doing something similar, Saudi has announced they want to do something similar as well. I would just say that cost parity on renewable energies is pretty much here, and when you think about it, the cost of these things are only going to get cheaper as technology improves, and the cost of fossil fuels are only going to get more expensive as the governments properly make those companies pay for the ex negative externalities they cause, whether that's through carbon capture or carbon credits. So big technologi technological changes. Thanks very much to the German uh, taxpayer for subsidizing all the research into the renewables, <coughs> and thanks to the Chinese for oversupplying the market and driving down the prices. Um, so now they're actually pretty attractive. So going for forward, I think great opportunities here. Um, so I would say there is a lot to be worried about, but as long as you, you're aware of de demographic issues, you can plan for them and address them. But there's also a lot of new opportunities going forward, which we can be excited about and try and make sure that we're on the right side to profit from. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. And thanks to all, all three of the speakers. So we're going to move into a Q&A session now. I have got some questions coming through on the iPad, but please do send more through. Uh, just to kick things off, uh, I'd like to start. Um, Joe, so you talked in your first slide about what next for market. So it was release of a pressure valve, start of a bear market, or Armageddon. So <laughs> which is more likely, and what should investors be doing? And then after you've answered, Joe, I'm sure Rudolf and Daniel will have some views on that one as well. Yeah, okay. I mean, I suspect that we think that the middle option in this, sorry, typical consultant sort of answer, <laughs> well, you know, sort of the one in the middle, probably the most likely. So just as a reminder, that was the idea that we're probably facing a, a, a bear market at some point. I, I think in terms of sort of what we'd be advising clients to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think... The first point would be to make sure that you're not relying on models that tell you that on average everything will be okay and make sure that you do some sort of proper qualitative scenario analysis. But, I mean, that, that's, that's nothing new. I think what we'd probably say is just have a real think about what you want to avoid. So, you know, what a pension scheme wants to avoid, particularly as it gets towards the end game, is disinvesting at completely the wrong time. So when we talk about scenario analysis, it's about thinking about particularly around cash flow, you know, and, and you know, so don't be disinvesting at the wrong time. Don't be over-reliant on one particular asset class. So really looking at kind of multiple sources of alpha, but also contractual income is something you'll hear us talking a lot about. Great. Rolf, do you want to... I won't pick the middle one then. I'll pick the first one. I think, uh, as I said, I was somewhat concerned in November and December as I, we saw that markets were getting pretty illiquid. And given the buildup of debt out there, you kind of worry that, that something which is insolvent becomes illiquid. And that was at the verge of, of, of happening. Um, so we've always built this assumption that probably a recession is most likely 2020. In December, I was more leaning towards 2019. Uh, but with the U-turn from central banks and probably uh, more coming, this looks more like 2015-16. Uh, the only thing missing is that the Chinese do some stimulus, which they've already announced. So then you have credit spreads coming down, you have leading indicators stabilizing, you have a yield curve which is still not inverted, credit spreads which have stabilized, so the worries are still there, but they won't come to fruition in 2019, nor would we say 220, so bets are now more like 221. Very good. Daniel? Um, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I would say when people were predicting double-digit earnings growth at the end of last year, and you could see all the liquidity coming out of the system, that was an easy, an easy point to say the market expectations are just wrong. Uh, where they are today with the, the, the stimul stimulative actions that they've put in place to try and stabilize the growth profile and engineer as a, a manufactured slowdown, which historically is very, very difficult, and usually they, they fail to achieve that. Um, I would say it's not, not quite clear. Um, 
So going from dub, double digit earnings growth to single digit low in, earnings growth, I think that's a good market correction. It means that the market expectations is a bit more realistic. Uh, what happens going forward? I still think we've got a lot of liquidity coming out of the system and those stimulative actions are just to reduce some of that off or to offset some of that reduction in liquidity. I think we are quite late cycle. There are quite a few imbalances uh, built up. So I'd still be more defensive in a portfolio overall. Uh, but it's a little bit difficult when you've got gilts and cash giving you negative real returns over a 10 year period. So not an easy answer of what to do, even if you know that a recession is coming or a slowdown is coming, what can you practically do about it? Then I've got a question that's come in on the iPad, really around political risk. So we did hear quite a lot about Brexit in the, in the last session. So I think we've gone there. We can talk about Brexit. But there's also lots of other political risk that, that we could discuss. And what impact is that going to have on portfolios? What are you thinking about that? So I don't know who wants to take that one first. Um, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, we don't have the slide here. But what we've done is um, if you make a comparison and count the number of votes going to center left and center right and take that back 20, 30, 40 years, you see that the center left and center right have been losing in terms of percentage of votes um, across 22 different countries. Um, there has been a sliding scale already. It accelerated post 2008, but the trend was already there. So something is brewing out there. Um, and you could blame it on identity, you could blame it on immigration, and you can blame it on globalization or uh, technology. Um, and I think for us, for investors, um, I think the, the main concern we should have is if we look back over the last 20, 30, 40 years, um, owners of capital have been doing really well. And we probably have the highest margins out there the lowest uh, taxes, lowest interest rates, lowest uh, labor share, lowest regulation, and I'll probably miss someone. And um, I think that trend, and you see that, that's moving, and I think that is part and parcel of what's going on underneath from an economic perspective. Um, so how to deal with that, I'm not sh politicians don't know how to deal with it. And uh, I think society as a whole is struggling to deal with it, but we know that something is, is something needs to change. And, and it's up to us as well to kind of come up with an answer. Yeah, uh, and I'll jump in there. So I think the, the winners, um, correctly said, have been the capital holders in the developed market and the labor in the emerging markets. Fair enough, yeah. And the people who have, who have missed out have been the, the middle income owners in, in de developed markets where wages have flatlined for the last 20 years. So that's created a, a bit of tension, I think, on a societal level. Um, I think it is quite concerning that we've got a lack of leadership on a global basis at the minute, because there are big things that the developed world has to deal with, the debt and the demographics. And you can only deal with them if, one, you recognize the problems, two, you've got reasonable people in place that can discuss rationally and uh, find solutions to those uh, issues. Uh, and then three, you have coordination across different parties. And I think all three of those we don't have at the minute. And that leads us to a slightly precarious position. Um, I just hope that sometimes you go the wrong way to find the right direction. And that's what, where we are at the minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, Emma, you've got three panellists who are largely kind of agreeing with each other. But I think sort of, I sort of made the point in, in, in my opening that you just sort of said there's something brewing and that's very much where we are. I think it's really difficult to put your finger on it. There's kind of a little bit of a niggle and quite how you articulate it. And without sort of wanting to run the risk of repeating what I said earlier, I think sort of the way that we'd be looking at it is that just be prepared to know what you would do if things kind of went wrong, which is so much more important for schemes now that they have shorter, shorter time horizons. Thank you. We've got some good questions coming in on the iPad. Thank you very much, everyone. So um, I'd like to ask my panel, what are your thoughts on risk for, um, of the transition into a low carbon economy? So our kind of climate type question, please. You had some thoughts on that, Dan, as you want to kick off. Yeah, so I think um, there will be assets that benefit from that and there will be assets that uh, um, 
are ad adversely affected by that. So I think it's just making sure you're, you're on the right side of those trends. And as I mentioned earlier on, um, I, th I think we've, for a long period of time, we, we haven't been charging companies the negative externality of fossil fuel consumption. I think that's going to be addressed going forward. Um, and that's going to help expedite that, uh, that, that trend. But when you look at it on a global scale, renewables are slightly above in most places to the cost parity of fossil fuels and other energy sources. In some markets, they're at parity. In other markets, they're actually cheaper. Uh, but these costs are going up and these costs are going down. So just being aware of when you're buying that asset and you have a 10 or 30 year um, investment period, thinking about what the environment's going to look like over that period. So I've bought uh, Pika plants uh, for backup electricity generation in, 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 the, in the past. Would I do that again today? Uh, maybe if I can get paid back in 10 years, but after 10 years, I think you've probably got batteries that replace the Pika plants. So there are some real investment implications there and you've got to be aware of those to make sure you're on the right side of them. But interesting changes. Uh, I'll make two points here. Uh, first is, uh, I think we're getting a carbon tax. Um, I was one of the signatures. Uh, there was been a, a letter in, in, in a local newspaper where 70 economists signed a letter and saying uh, we should have a carbon tax because that's the easiest way to solve a lot of these issues, um, which obviously the corporate sector didn't fully agree with. Um, but hey, this is something that needs to happen. And we also, the second point is I, we also see it from our clients who are kind of demanding that we not only deliver returns in monetary terms, but they, their pen, the pension scheme also wants to be able to, that people live in a world where there's still <laughs> breathable air. Uh, so financial returns is one thing, but the second thing is um, how, do you, how do you get those returns? And so we need to, we're being asked to push um, companies into that, that direction, and we're doing that. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that I'd add to that is that if you're a trustee of a pension scheme with a very packed agenda at every single meeting you, you attend, that I think you probably just have to be aware about the fact that we've had an explosion of different opportunities and some great ones. And, you know, particularly if you look at things like, you know, having a sustainably themed private markets portfolio, how many boxes does that tick? I mean, you know, but the point is that there are lots of things out there that you could consider and again, sort of short time horizons, et cetera, it's just sort of keeping a bit of focus, I think. Great, and then um, a question here around sort of technology. So the question is, Daniel's outlook for AI was rather benign. I've heard others argue quite the opposite and that we really need to get these robots to like us or, you know, destruction won't be the worst outcome for the human race. That's really cheery, isn't it? But. Um, <laughs> Thinking about, you know, how, how can we keep up as AI evolves? You know, what, what are the challenges and opportunities that all of this brings us? Daniel, I'm going to pick on you to start yeah. again because you, you did show us those robots in the, in the <laughs> hotel, so you have to start. Yeah, so I think, I think this is a, one of the ways potentially to address our productivity issues. Um, but you've got to make sure that the workforce is suitably trained. So the question just, do you have a generation shift? We've got one generation that's not trained to really use this and it, they, they miss out on the benefits and then it sweeps to the generation below that. So I just encourage everybody to make sure that your, your employees, your kids, your communities have the appropriate skill set to succeed in a digi digital age, because all the companies are going digital nowadays. So, and I think uh, it can be a way for us to address productivity issues, especially with an aging workforce. I think it can be a very good way for us to utilize that. I think the other questions are just do you, do you miss a generation um, and the social implications that has? And two, um, does this lead to longer term structural unemployment if you've got more automation? And do you need some sort of living wage arrangement or so forth? So big discussion points, but I think technology is a good thing because it should make us more productive at doing our work and improve people's quality of lives. Uh, it just needs to be equally spread across society. I concur with that. I think uh, globalization and technology has done great things for the average uh, person. It lifted a lot of people out of poverty, but you need to be mindful of people who are left behind, who don't get, don't get along with the globalization or with the technology. So that's the, the challenge. 
Um, and in terms of the speed at which it's going, I've, I've always been reminded of the Luddites. Uh, I'm not sure how the speed was at that time, I wasn't there. Um, but every, <laughs> every job, uh, every year, 1% of all, of, of the new jobs, 1% of all the jobs are new. Uh, so my older son is now looking at where he wants to study, and I said, well, the, I, don't, I don't know either, <laughs> but you have to be able to continue to learn and um, get yourself the skill set and the benefit we have is that, uh, luckily, a computer can't do presentations still. Uh, they, can, they can make the data easier, but they can't do the presentation yet. So human skills are also very important. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll just start with an apology for anyone who's coming to our client conference next week, because this is what I'm going to talk about next week. So <laughs> maybe you don't have to come. Um, so essentially, it, I, I think sort of the way that we've been approaching this is sort of in three ways. One, we think about how AI in particular is going to impact markets. Then we've kind of done some work on how AI might impact asset managers. And then clearly, kind of we as a firm need to be thinking about how technology and AI will, um, will change. So sort of at a market level without sort of, I mean, it's not my area of expertise, but without going on to sort of a, a, a big spiel, you just think about some of the anecdotes that we hear investment managers talking about in the sense that, you know, apartment blocks being built in China with no kitchens because actually people don't need them because delivering, you know, having food delivered at the touch of a button is just way cheaper than actually, you know, from a time cost, but also sort of in terms of the cost of, of food um, and also equipping kitchens that people just don't, aren't going to have kitchens, a, a, apparently. So, you know, and then you sort of start to move that down in terms of how that's going to impact companies that produce things and I think sort of one example that I heard was you know what's going to happen I don't know if I probably shouldn't name companies but what would happen to a particular company if no one needs washing up liquid anymore and you know I mean it's sort of silly examples but you start to see how that could impact sort of market dynamics um, you know then if we start to look at investment managers we did a paper a year or so ago about sort of whether or not AI could actually start to replace the role of fundamental analysts that sort of stock picking investment managers. You know, and I mean, I, we don't think it will for sort of quite some time to come. And there's a whole debate there about whether or not machines are rational or logical, etc. But, you know, you're certainly moving towards a point that sort of technology or AI and, and sort of human beings are working much closer in tandem. And that has massive implications for the types of strategies that managers might be able to offer for clients. It perhaps sort of asks questions about, about fees, etc. But then in terms of sort of firms like ours, we need to be responding as well in the sense that you can talk a lot about big data, kind of whatever that means. It kind of blows my mind a bit when I try to think about it. But we need to be getting to grips with, you know, if there is this sort of huge and ever-changing data set out there, how can we be using it to kind of spot trends more quickly, to see what's sort of happening? Other things that we might be looking at are clearly we put ratings on investment managers' strategies in terms of whether we think they'll do well or not. So actually is the next step for us to start using AI along with our research to start having a bit more of a predictive power to our ratings so that our clients can move more quickly. Which well, is just fascinating sort of what might happen. And to Daniel's point about how quickly things might change, you know, I, I think we'll be facing a very different industry in 10 years, in 10 years time. I would, just as an add-on, I would concur with that. I think what can be automated will be automated. <laughs> and uh, just as a reminder, 70% of all equity trades are already done by algos. 30% uh, of credit trades are done by computers. There's hardly any human involved. Um, I think as for our industry, um, it's, I, don't see, I don't see them doing fundamental analysis yet. <laughs> But building the balance sheets and building the, P &L, uh, the, the profit and loss statements and going through that, and um, I think that a computer can do. And I would be remi just remind yourselves of what computers and chess was able to do 10, 20 years ago. But nowadays, it is not chess or it's not a chess player or a computer. It is chess and a computer. The combination works works better. And there's some great papers on that on the combination. I would advise you to read those. It's good. 
Very good. I, I'm sure um, you know AI could replace my role of reading out questions from an iPad, but I will continue to read out questions from an iPad. So uh, here's, here's a good one. So diversification is a great strategy, but when you weigh up the issues that keep you awake, how do you ensure you have enough risk in the portfolio to capture upside? Uh, and also, kind of, you know, where do we see some opportunities to actually capture returns in this current scenarios? Who wants do, to go first on that? Do you that? want me to start on yes, that? Yes, um, go for it, Joe. I, I would just sort of take a step back and really question how much upside you really need. I think people kind of tend to think that they need sort of great returns, but actually, you know, sorry, I've talked a lot, of, or I've mentioned a lot about the fact that many pension schemes have a shorter term time horizon than they used to have. Um, but, you know, 5, 10, 15 years till you sort of reach endgame is still quite, it's quite a long time. So a slow and steady approach rather than a capturing it up here and then sort of taking the, the, the downturn, um, I think, needs thinking about very carefully. And I think sort of, you know, most pension schemes still have guilt-related discount rates. Yields are very low. Discount rates are therefore very low. And therefore, actually, you don't need a huge amount of return to get to where you're going. So yeah, I would caution whether you need to be chasing um, high returns, which is probably a good thing given where we are. Mm. Um, I, I think it depends on your liability structure and your sensitivity to changes in your, in your funding ratios. Um, so corporate schemes are reporting quarterly earnings uh, are very different to sort of our schemes, which are basically liabilities backed by the government with open schemes at very long dated uh, structures. So we have the ability to take a lot more risk than a, than a corporate scheme where the CFO is looking at the balance sheet on a quarterly basis and, and worried about the impact of variability in funding ratios. Mm -hmm. So it means we're in a very different position and we can do potentially more interesting things that generate higher returns. Um, I would say diversification is generally a little bit confused. People think they're buying more managers or more assets so they're diversifying. It's really understanding what the risk drivers are in, in the things that you're buying and making sure you've got diversification in the risk drivers. That's the key, and if you can do that, then your portfolio is a little bit more robust. Just adding new asset classes or new managers, which I see a lot of people do, doesn't necessarily improve your diversification. If anything, it, it dilutes your alpha. So I always like portfolios that are concentrated, but with diverse risk drivers underneath them. Uh, the one thing I would add is, I, if, uh, as I said, the, most expected returns on beta would ex for, sorry uh, on beta are low um, and I think that's a given so but given also that uh, what we know what the drivers have been over the last couple of years which is basically a global growth synchronized growth and cheap money um, you see that everything trying to kind of trade it in a similar way um, if you look, for example, at uh, corporate credit, m more than 50% of all credit now has a triple B rating. Um, the companies with good balance sheets want to move down uh, to take advantage of lower, lower rates. The companies which are in this somewhat in more of a stress situation want to move up, so everybody wants to be triple B. Uh, but not all companies are alike, so that gives you a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of dispersion coming, so that would hopefully hopefully, benefit the, the active manager again to make real distinctions and to add substantial returns because you kind of need the alpha. Great. I'd just like to check if there's any questions out in the room where people wanted to raise their hand and ask a question. Got any questions out there? You have been sending me in questions from the iPad, so I'll, I'll continue my exciting role of reading out more <laughs> questions from, from the iPad. But th this is a nice one. So... Given the surprise results of recent events such as Brexit, Trump and Leicester winning the league, that may <laughs> tell us who sent that question in, what are the potential surprises that would fundamentally change your current views and be positive for the world? So this is a kind of upbeat question. Inflation. Inflation, right, good, nice one word answer there. Uh, Tottenham winning the Champions League. <laughs> <laughs> or, or winning anything for that matter, not fussy. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Joe, it doesn't oh, have to be geez. football related, yeah, no, no, just to no, be. No, don't clear. ask me about football. I might take yeah. a rain check on that. I think we've spent so long kind of waiting for a downturn that, or predicting it and being wrong. Yeah, no, I might take a rain check on that, I think. I, I think the key thing for us to look going forward are earnings. So, what happens with earnings? Um, so, corporates are operating at pretty high uh, margins. You're seeing the evidence of some uh, cost pressure 
in the structures that could pressurize those mar margins. And we've seen slower growth in non-US markets in 18, and the US is gonna slow this year. So if you've got pressure on your margins and you've got slower demand, it implies that your earnings are coming down. Now, how quickly those earnings come down and where they end, I think is the key question. I think we don't have the massive issues that we had in 2008, where you had a sharp deleveraging. We have more, we just have too much debt. We have an aging population. Uh, we have high asset prices. Uh, we have very low rates, very low real rate rates. There's not much lower that they can go from here. Famous last words. Um, so your future returns um, are looking challenged and the key is just looking at your earnings on your equity. Because you know, if you're buying a, a fixed income instrument, you know, unless there's a default, what your return outcome is going to be over the period that you hold the bond. But for equities, it's really the residual piece. So what's left over for the equity holder? And that's really a function of earnings. So really understanding the earnings trend, I think, is, is, is key. Another very positive question coming in on the iPad. I'm really you know, thinking the positivity in the room here is great. Is, so what's the most exciting thing that you're seeing in the market? We're bored of all these downturns and gloom. Let's have some excitement. Oh dear, <laughs> that was a tough one. Silence. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think productivity growth, um, if technology is used appropriately and properly, productivity could be a lot higher going forward than what people think. So I don't think necessarily that's a, that's a negative. Um, I think that could be quite a, a strong positive if you can transform to the, the new economy and the new ways of doing things. Yeah, I mean, I guess a slightly tongue-in-cheek answer might well be um, lots of potential mergers between uh, actuarial firms, uh, <laughs> providing quite a lot of excitement um, at the moment. Very good, yes. <laughs> we thought that was going to happen, and then it, they're not, but yeah, fine. Well, what, what would you say? Like, exciting things in the market at the moment? No, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't really know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's fine. I, I, we can go I, back to doom and gloom. That's, no, that's, I'm not doom no and gloom. I think <laughs> I, what I what I like about this business is it's it's always interesting. You try and try and understand the world, and the best if you really understand what's going on, then you kind of try and make money from it. Um, hence, I'm always interested in what's going on, and that's trying to feel what's 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 driving things. Um, really interesting, as I said, inflation would be very good, and uh, I'll explain that uh, that that would really get me enthusiastic because. I think it would help a lot. It would help um, release debt burdens. It would solve a lot of issues in the financial industry. It would hopefully, if it goes in hand in hand with uh, a rising purchasing power of the consumer, it would alleviate some of the issues we just talked about regarding uh, populism. Um, so that would really get me, get me enthused. I'm not sure that would be great for Daniel's clients, though, in terms nope. of LGPS funds with uncapped inflation liabilities. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Good, some disagreement on the panel <laughs> yes. at last. Yes, we were looking forward to that. So we're getting towards the end of the session. Um, there's a question that's come in about um, population growth. <laughs> and, you know, really, you know, how, how is that factored into your thinking? You know, clearly world population is expanding at a rapid rate. Very intellectual question here with lots of facts that I won't read out. But, you know, it, it, it is really all about, you know, how does that play a part in, in your thinking, concerns, positives, negatives? If, if we run a scenario analysis for and run a long term strategic asset allocation, there are two main items to think about uh, growth in the long term. One of it is uh, demographics and the other one is uh, productivity. So it's, it, that's where it starts. Um, and in, in that sense, you kind of see, well, population growth in terms of working force population that is declining in most of the developed, developed world. Hence, we can't be overly excited about getting 3-4% growth rates unless we get a productivity uh, spike. So that's basically demographics. That's basically where it starts. And I think uh, demographic uh, growth rates are slowing down universally across the world, apart from maybe some sub-Saharan African countries. Um, so I think the population peak may be a little bit sooner than, than what people expect, because those trends are changing quite quickly. So I think the in information dissem dissemination across the world uh, has really transformed a lot of these societies. 
and a lot of the sharing of the knowledge with the lesser countries is really allowing them to get up to the speed a lot quicker. Um, so they're catching up pretty quickly. Um, I think when you're looking at things like long-term assets like infrastructure, um, thinking about being positioned in countries where there's good, good demographics, so you know that people are going to need to use these services and pay for these services for a long period of time, that's a great way to be positioned. So as long as you understand the risks of investing. Jo, thoughts on that? Um, not particularly. I suppose sort of the things that um, would come front of my mind would be, yeah, I mean, I think the points we've made about where exactly you're expecting to sort of experience population growth. So you start to think about scarcity of resource in terms of an opportunity potentially, but then also demand for services, which I guess Daniel's, Daniel's covered. Great. So, I mean, we're pretty much coming to the end of the session. So unless I can see any questions in the audience, which I can't, I'd just like to ask each of the panellists sort of, you know, your, your final thought that you'd like to leave with the audience. So this is what concerns you, what keeps you awake at night. That's, that's the theme of this session. You know, just briefly kind of a summary of, uh, of your key thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I think mine would be fairly short in the sense that, you know, there is no, there is no doubt that the world will change, quite how it will. I mean, we've all sort of we mentioned sort of some sort of niggle on, um, on, on political risk. You know, we've talked about some sort of explosion in terms of the impact of technology. Things are going to look really very different over a fairly short space of time. So I think sort of, again, audience sort of in mind, trustees just really need to think hard about the things that really matter and the things that could really have a negative, sorry, it's kind of go back to the negative again, but the things that could really have a negative impact and make sure that they're as protected as possible for that. And I can't help but go back to think about this whole idea of making sure that you've got lots of contractual income built into portfolios so that, you know, it deals with the ultimate goal, which is paying out pensions, but it then means that we're not forced into making the wrong decisions at the wrong time if we get all of our predictions wrong. Thanks, Joe. Okay, um, I've shown you three pictures uh, that keep me awake at night. Uh, zombies, a crocodile and a roller coaster. To end on a positive note, uh, a roller coaster can be fun as well. Um, and the short-term outlook, as I just said, the short-term outlook for markets I think is pretty okay. So if you think about the roller coaster in that sense, your stomach might hurt a bit, but will probably go for another ride. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Daniel? Um, probably the thing that worries me most is public procurement because <laughs> I'm just learning what exactly it is. Um, that's a, a new thing for me. I, th I, th I think uh, on the capital markets front, uh, as long as you understand the challenges, you can position accordingly and set expectations realistically. And I think that's an important thing, just having realistic expectations of what can be delivered, what the parameters are around that and what the risks are. Um, and then having a long-term view and not overreacting to, to short-term market movements. I think markets tend to go the opposite way to what you expect them. Um, I haven't seen a lot of people who can consistently uh, generate money from sort of tactical asset allocation and these sorts of, sorts of things. So just making sure you have good, robust strategic asset allocation, you set your expectations realistic, realistically and uh, the range and parameters around those. And then I, I think longer term, it's really debt high debt levels, aging demographics, um, and lack of, um, I think, leadership across a range, of, a, a range of areas that would be sort of concerns. But I do think there are a lot of great things happening in the world at the minute. And the one positive note I'll finish on is, um, I think we had a, a, a realm of creativity in the late 90s leading up to the internet boom, uh, with people investing in tech companies that were all losing money. Um, and some of those actually, actually turned out quite well. Um, some of them didn't. Um, where we are now, it's interestingly interesting. Some, a lot of those tech companies have matured and are throwing off quite a lot of cash flow. So they're now your new quality companies, whereas in the last, uh, or in a couple of downturns ago, th those were your junk companies that had a lot of negative cash flow. But I think there is a lot of creativity in, on the venture space at the minute. There's a lot of new things coming online. There's a lot of changes. And I think this spark of creativity has, has, has really happened in the last five years again. A bit of creative destruction. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone, for your questions that you sent through. And big thanks to our fantastic panellists.